Hello, everybody. It is my great honor and pleasure to welcome Nigel Hickson as our five o'clock speaker. And uh, let me briefly introduce Nigel. So Nigel was born in 1963, and he got his PhD from Dalhousie in 1985. So I guess it was at the age of 22, right? You got your PhD yeah. when you were 22. So you guys who are 22 and do not have your PhD yet, please rethink your way of life and see what's wrong with you. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, Nigel is a great mathematician in, in the area of non-quantitative geometry, in particular operator algebras and K-theory. Uh, today, he will indulge us with representation theory, which figured quite a lot in the, it's very important in the Baumkorn conjecture. Uh, I think that one of your most influential papers is this Baum con Hickson about Baum con. Would you agree? It's one of my favorite papers. Yeah. Okay. I, I it's a fundamental paper in the Baum con, which is by Baum con and Hickson. And uh, Nigel is also not an alien to bend level, and I can prove it. Look, now you have a first test. Where is Nigel? Well, Nigel is right here um, in the middle. Uh, this was in 2016, if I remember correctly. If you still don't believe it, well, Nigel was lecturing here in person for the whole week. Okay. But, but now uh, you see this was in our old lecture hall. So uh, I'm afraid uh, we have to lure you again to come in person to Ben Lever because now we have 1 million euro brand new state of the art lecture hall uh, from which we are transmitting right now. So I hope that uh, in some further time we'll be able to tempt you again to come in person. But for the time being, uh, I, I, you'll just uh, speak on Zoom. And we are delighted to have you here, of course. And now uh, the Zoom is yours. Take it away. OK. Um, thank you very much, Piotr. It will take me just a moment to share the screen. I don't know why, but it's a little slow to do so. Um, but I'll not try and make it as fast as possible. And in the meantime, I'll just keep talking. I'm going to talk about uh, yeah, some representation theory, as Piotr said. Can you hear me, by the way? Yeah, we can hear Everyone you very happy? Well. Okay, yeah. good. Um, something very old, uh, but something I'm a big fan of, the vile character formula. Let me see if I have everything uh, that's interesting. Uh, just seems to cut off. It's supposed to fit the... Um, frame of the, this Zoom window perfectly, but but as you see, it doesn't. But OK, fine, we'll just have to cope with that in due course. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Vile character formula. Uh, this is about 100 years old, uh, so it's not new, um, certainly not due to me. What makes it so fascinating uh, to mathematicians is the way in which it keeps popping up again and again and again, it concerns a very basic topic. So the topic itself uh, reoccurs in, in various parts of mathematics. But what makes it the most interesting is the way in which different uh, parts of mathematics actually inform this formula, give us new perspectives on this formula, new proofs of this formula. There's a wonderful article of uh, Atiyah from um, 1978. He was retiring as president of the London Mathematical Society. And he speaks of the unity of mathematics. That's a favorite phrase of a tier. And this uh, Val character formula is a wonderful advertisement for the unity of mathematics, the way that different parts of mathematics, whatever it is you do, somehow impinges uh, on this single same formula. Of course, I don't have time to show you everything that impinges on this. So we'll just uh, look at it from, from one perspective. But in fact, the one perspective requires already a scope of ideas. We'll see some Hilbert space theory, which conveniently had just been invented at the time that Hermann Weyl had uh, first proved this formula. And we'll see some calculus, calculus on geometric spaces, calculus on manifolds, if you like, simple manifolds like spheres and so on. And what the formula looks like is what you see in the red box. There are some functions, character functions on the left. Those are the chi's. Uh, and the character functions are given in a mysterious way as, as, as ratios of two things. And this alt of T that you see on the top is a sort of alternating sum, like you see in the definition of a determinant. And delta, the famous vile denominator, is different. You'll see it's a big product. And so the formula has all sorts of interesting bits and pieces to it. And maybe that's one of the reasons it comes about again and again and again. 
Anyway, so I'm going to try and introduce this formula. Of course, I have to tell you what it's about, and I have to describe to you some of the something about the area of mathematics which it belongs to. Uh, I'll try to say something about its remarkable features. I reorganized uh, this talk just to put that at the end, just in case I don't have time. Uh, but I also want to describe how Vial proved it, because the proof is, the journey uh, towards the proof is, is just as interesting as the result itself. Okay, so some 100-year-old uh, mathematics uh, for us. Oh, that fits better. So this formula is about uh, Lie groups, compact connected Lie groups. So groups uh, which are simultaneously geometric spaces, compact uh, manifolds, connected compact uh, manifolds. And uh, time is short, so I shall focus on one collection of examples, the so-called special unitary groups. I could have done regular unitary groups instead, but I uh, decided to talk about these special unitary groups. So this is the group of all n by n, complex matrices, so the entries, entries are complex numbers, and it should be a unitary matrix. So the matrix times its conjugate transpose is the identity. And finally, uh, this is what the S stands for, the, the matrices should have determinant one. Uh, so this is one of the um, four basic series of, of uh, compact groups uh, out there, the so-called type A example. And uh, I don't want to overexert myself, so wherever it's convenient to do so, I'll, I'll just pretend that n is equal to three. And occasionally I'll, I'll pretend that n is equal to two. Uh, I would pretend throughout that n is equal to two and make it as simple as possible, except for the fact that uh, sometimes the two by two example is just a little too small to, to give you a proper indication of what's going on. Three by three is better, uh, but for many things you'll see there's no difference between three and um, n. So we'll do n. Uh, uh, and a little bit of three and, and a little bit of two. Okay. And I want to emphasize because it's something you can take away if you don't like representations. Uh, I want to emphasize some geometry of these groups, make you think about them uh, in, a, in as concrete a way as possible. There's a lot to be said, volumes to be said about the geometry of compact Lie groups. And we're just going to look at the very most basic things uh, here today. Uh, so here's uh, a little example, SU2, the two by two unitary matrices, they have determinant one. It happens that they, they all have this uh, simple uh, form here. They, they depend on just two complex numbers, alpha and beta. Once you've filled in two entries of this two by two matrix, alpha and beta, the unitarity condition and the determinant one condition tell you automatically that the other two entries just have to be the, the conjugates of the entries you started with, arranged the way I've arrange them here. Uh, this would be so, except I missed off a crucial minus sign, which I guess I can amend, just like that. Now it's correct. And the determinant one condition says now that mod alpha squared plus mod beta squared uh, is equal to one. So the two complex numbers, alpha and beta, and alpha squared plus beta squared is equal to one. That means the two complex numbers sit on the unit sphere of C2. So what this group is, is a sphere in C2, in other words, a three-dimensional sphere. It's a very concrete geometric thing. And that's going to be important because we'll be doing some calculus with these groups. And it's good to know that these groups aren't just abstract nonsense. You can actually learn to learn to get to know them a little bit. What about SU3? Well, it's a, it's a little bit more complicated to figure out what, what it looks like. But roughly speaking, it's a product of a, of a three-dimensional sphere and uh, a five-dimensional sphere. So overall, it's an eight-dimensional geometric space, uh, SU3, and roughly speaking, it's a product of S3 and S5. What it actually is a, is a fibered product. It's a fibration over S5, and the fiber is S3. So these groups have a very concrete uh, nature to them in any given case. They're always built up out of odd-dimensional spheres in roughly the way that SU3 is built up out of S3 and S5. That's just the way they are. All right, here's a, a little more geometry, which is uh, another way of looking at these uh, geometric uh, spaces. It's going to be relevant to look inside of the group uh, G at a certain subgroup T, and that's just the group of diagonal uh, matrices inside of G. So G uh, here in this uh, picture that you see is either uh, SU2 or SU3, and the diagonal matrices, of course, are two by two diagonal matrices, or three by three diagonal matrices. And of course, there are conditions on, on the Zs that you see here uh, 
for this to be a unitary matrix and have to de determinant one. Uh, and in particular, the determinant one condition tells you in the case of the first T that Z1 times Z2 is one, and in the second T that Z1 times Z2 times Z3 is one. So these are actually one and two dimensional respectively, even though they involve uh, apparently the way I wrote them, two and three complex numbers of modulus one. Okay, and the geometry I want to, you to think about a little bit is the, the map which is displayed at, at the very bottom, and it involves this group T called a torus or maximal torus inside of G, and then the whole, the, the, cos, the um, coset space, the left coset space G modulo T, so the set of all left cosets. That's another example of a manifold. We'll take a look at it in a moment. And then there's an interesting map which takes you from T times G mod T, whoops, see, see if I can restore that, that takes you from uh, T times G mod T uh, to G. Namely, you take uh, the diagonal matrix T and then you conjugate it by G basically, and, and you get a general uh, SUN matrix. Now it's a fact that every unitary matrix is a conjugate in this way to a diagonal matrix. That's linear algebra, isn't it? That you can diagonalize any matrix. So this map that I just written down is, is onto every group element G on the right-hand side can be reached by this conjugation map from some diagonal matrix. So, uh, and, and moreover, if you think about it, the, the, the data which reaches any given matrix is more or less unique. If you happen to have a matrix inside of G, which has distinct eigenvalues, and that's the generic case, then uh, the only um, pre-images of that group element in G inside of this space T times G mod T are the n factorial elements you could get by permuting the di diagonal eigenvalues in the T variable, and then the, the conjugation matrix is completely determined. So there's our map uh, again, and uh, here's just a little bit of geometry just for fun. Uh, if you take uh, the group G and divide by T from this space of left cosets for SU2, uh, then what you get is a two-dimensional sphere. You can check that it's a two-dimensional sphere, and, and what it is, is uh, maybe a little better to think of it as, as, as this complex one-dimensional manifold CP1, the Riemann sphere, if you like. Okay, if you do this for SU3, it's kind of interesting what happens. So SU3 has eight dimensions and T has two dimensions. So G divided by G actually has six dimensions. And uh, what you get is the so-called flag variety, the complete flag variety for C3. It's a certain well-known from algebraic geometry um, complex algebraic variety. And that's always what happens for SUN and for all of the other compact connected Lie groups out there. G mod T is always an interesting complex algebraic geometric space. Okay. And the map that I'm describing, this conjugation map, is always basically a covering map. Generically, on a big open set, it's, it's, it is a covering map. And uh, the, it's a covering map of, of degree n factorial for SUN. Uh, but then there are some special cases where it's not a covering map. For example, if you take the identity element in G, then, then what you see back here in T times G mod T is something much bigger than just a discrete set of n factorial elements, namely it's the identity element of T times any element of G mod T. So it's a ramified covering, a covering with some singularities. And uh, the degree of the, the cover is just n factorial. These numbers two and six here is a bit unfortunate are the same as the numbers two and six, which appear at the top of the page. That's just a coincidence. Uh, uh, these numbers two and six are twice the number of so-called positive roots, and uh, these numbers are n factorial. And so we would see a difference if we did SU4. Okay, so what's this eval character formula about? It's, it's about group representations, and let's just absorb some of the most basic uh, ideas. So we have a group G, like SUN, a compact uh, Lie group, and uh, we're interested in representations, finite dimensional representations of this compact Lie group. That just means ways of mapping G into n by n matrices. That's what a representation is, and, and could be anything but, but some finite number. And uh, the, the problem that Weil uh, was addressing is, is how to classify these things uh, if it indeed is possible, up to equivalence. There's an obvious way of changing one representation to get yourself another, which is just to conjugate by some invertible matrix in GLNC. 
Uh, and then you get out of pi two, you, you get a, a pi one. Uh, and the, the difference between pi one and pi two is not any substantial or interesting thing. We'll just regard pi one and pi two as being equivalent if they're obtained from each other in this rather trivial way, just by conjugation. So the problem is to understand finite dimensional representations of a group like SUN up to equivalence. And it's not obvious that this is an interesting problem, or and it's certainly not obvious that it's a solvable problem, but it is interesting. That's what happens to be the case, what comes to be discovered as you go through mathematical life and you encounter variations on this problem again and again and again. And the solution, as I'll show you, is very interesting indeed. So that's what we're studying. Uh, and in particular, we're studying what are called uh, irreducible representations. Uh, and first of all, to be irreducible just means that the representation pi cannot be broken down into a block direct sum of two other representations, block diagonal sum of two other representations, pi one and pi two. I should have underlined or put it in red, uh, not here. So a representation is irreducible if it's not decomposable uh, modulo equivalence into smaller representations. And it's, <coughs> excuse me, a fact that every representation can be decomposed, it's sort of obvious if you think about it, into smaller and smaller and smaller representations just by continuing the decomposition process until you can go no further and those um, atomic pieces out of which any given representation are, are, is built are, are going to be irreducible representations. So every representation is equivalent to a direct sum, essentially a unique direct sum of irreducible representations. That's called semi-simplicity. And if, therefore, you want to classify all representations, you might as well focus on these irreducible representations. Once you know the irreducibles, you know everything. That's a fact about compact groups, which is what we're talking about. It's not a fact about all the groups in general, but it is a fact about compact groups. And so more particularly, what uh, Vial is going to do is provide us with a list of all of the irreducible representations of a compact group like SUN. And the SUN case is the only one I'm going to discuss here. Here are some examples uh, for our smallest uh, group, our little baby group, uh, SU2, the three-dimensional sphere with some interesting group multiplication. There's always the trivial representation. It's allowed, it's legal to send every group element to the identity one by one matrix. That's a legal, irreducible representation. You may say, shouldn't we just have the lawyers throw that out? Well, it's better to keep it in. And so there's always the trivial representation. There's always at least one representation and there it is. If we're talking about a matrix group like SU2, then there's all, always a sort of obvious representation. They're already matrices. So there's a sort of identity representation, <clears throat> which in this Lee theoretic, context is called the fundamental representation. Uh, so that's another representation which is there. But then there are others. Uh, for example, here's a kind of a crazy formula, three, uh, a representation of the group of two by two unitary matrices in, inside of three by three matrices is called the adjoint representation. I hope I got the formula right. And so there's some interesting third uh, representation to, to, to ponder. It's not obvious looking at the third one whether or not it's irreducible. And uh, for example, it, maybe it's equivalent in some interesting way to the di direct sum of the trivial representation and the fundamental representation, the numbers uh, add up, one plus two is three, the size of the matrices is right. And it's not particularly obvious, but that's not what's happening. Uh, but indeed, these are all three uh, distinct irreducible inequivalent, which is to say irreducible representations. They happen to, for SU2, to be the only representations, irreducible representations of dimensions one, two, and three, uh, respectively. That emerges out of this uh, vial character formula. And it turns out there's a representation of dimension four, or one of dimension five, and, and so on. That's the story for, for SU2. The story for these diagonal subgroups is a lot simpler because by linear algebra, if you have an irreducible representation or for, to begin with any representation of, of, a, of a commutative group, what you actually have is just a bunch of commuting matrices. And if you have a bunch of commuting matrices, then 
modulo a small detail, which I'll suppress, they can be simultaneously diagonalized. And, and so you can take any representation of T and actually write it down by this diagonalization matrix as a block sum of simpler, smaller uh, representations. So all of the irreducible representations are one dimensional and they all just look like this. This is the only way of making a one dimensional representation. Just take the entries of T particular representation here where a1 and a2 and a3 were all equal to one another for example they were all two N Nigel two, I don't two, know two. if you're aware but you froze for a while I am not aware and okay. um so about about uh, 97 seconds you have to backtrack okay let me go back it, was I legible or understandable uh when this slide was in play Everything was legible, understandable, but then at a certain moment you completely froze. There was no sound, no movement, nothing. Okay, my apologies for that. Um, and thank you for telling me. Uh, what we're looking at here, just to recap, are three representations of SU2. They're just three examples, just for fun. And there are, it's an exercise you can amuse yourself by hand to check that these are all irreducible. Of course, they're distinct up to equivalence because of dimensions, but it's not so obvious, that, uh, but true, that these are the only one, two, and three-dimensional representations, respectively, of SU2. And if you're dealing with uh, not SUN, but these groups of diagonal matrices in SUN, uh, things are a lot simpler, because linear algebra tells you that, tells you a lot about commuting families of representations. And what it tells you is that if you have a commuting, excuse me, a commuting family of matrices, if you have a commuting family of matrices, they can always be simultaneously diagonalized, or at least they can be simultaneously put into upper triangular form. And in this particular context, actually, they can always be simultaneously diagonalized. So the only irreducible representations are one dimensional into one by one matrices. And the only possibilities are given by this formula here. And at the very bottom of this slide, I'm just making a certain point, which has to do with the equation that we have in SUN, that the determinant is one. So for example, the Zs that you see in this picture, the Zs that you see in this picture satisfy the relation Z1 times Z2 times Z3 is equal to one. What that means is that this representation that I've just written down doesn't really depend on the triple a1 a2 a3 so much as the equivalence class of this triple modulo constant triples so the parameter space for irreducible representations of t the maximal torus in su3 is this space of z3 all possible triples of integers modulo the constant triples so it's some two-dimensional rank two free abelian group okay we'll come back to that now um, before Vial and before compact groups, there was a small industry uh, investigating finite groups. Uh, before compact groups were understood, actually what came first was the circle group uh, investigated by Fourier, but we'll put him to one side for a moment. Before uh, Vial, there were Robinius and Schur and others who studied representations exactly in the sense that I was just telling you. Uh, but of finite groups, not, not Lie groups, but finite groups. And they did this not so long before Hermann Weyl at the end of the 19th century. This was a popular topic. And the, the main tool that these guys um, invented in order to study representations was the so-called character of a representation. It means the you, you take the representation pi, which is a homomorphism into matrices, and then you just compose with the trace function on matrices. And that converts, <clears throat> excuse me, that converts every representation into a function on the group. And the idea is that functions are easier than, which are scalar valued functions, are, are easier than matrix valued functions. Okay. On the other hand, this the algebra of this quant of this function is not so easy. It's no longer a group homomorphism, of course. So these gentlemen uh, at the top here, Fabrinius and Schur and so on, uh, studied characters, and here's what they figured out. It's rather nice. First of all, if you want to know about the equivalence class of a representation, 
the, the character tells you everything. If two representations are equivalent, they have the same character. And more interesting, if two representations have the same character, then they are uh, equivalent. So the character is the perfect tool for studying representations up to equivalence. Now this character, this, this trace function, uh, whatever it might be, excuse me, uh, whatever it might be, it has the trace property that, that the character applied to a product of group elements H times G is the same as the character applied to the product of group elements G times H. That's just because the trace has such a property, the trace of AB for any two matrices AB is equal to the trace of BA. Uh, functions on a group which have this property here are said to are called class functions. And so the character, in other words, is a class function. And one of the great theorems uh, from the era of representation theory of finite groups is this theorem at the bottom of the page, which says that the characters of irreducible representations, also called irreducible characters, actually form a basis. They're linearly independent. That's the first thing. And the second thing is they form a basis for the vector space of all of these class functions. That's kind of a remarkable result. For example, here's, uh, um, oh, that's interesting. I, uh, <laughs> I meant to say something about example, but maybe I deleted that slide. So let me just talk about it. Uh, so it on the basis of the bottom theorem, you can just guess or not guess, determine how many irreducible representations there are, because there are as many dimensions of class functions, functions satisfying this relation here, as there are conjugacy classes in the group. So the number of irreducible representations of a finite group is exactly equal to the number of class functions. Excuse me, the number of conjugacy classes. If you take a group like, uh, I don't know, permutations on three uh, letters, S3, then uh, with a little bit of thinking, you can see, you see it has three conjugacy classes and therefore it has three irreducible representations. So if you want to classify all of the irreducible representations of the permutation group on three letters, you just have to find three distinct irreducible representations because once you've found them, that's it. There are no more, thanks to this wonderful theorem of whoever it was uh, due to, Frobenius, Scher, and so on. Actually, the theorem can be strengthened a, a little bit. Uh, the, the characters of irreducible representations actually form an orthonormal basis of the space of all class functions. Once you put an inner product, so you can talk about orthonormality, once you put an inner product on the space of class functions on G, and the standard way of doing it is in this formula here. There's a normalization that you put in if you want the characters actually to have norm one. So characters are always, no matter what the irreducible representation is, no matter how many dimensions it has, Characters are always of the same size. That's what the first part of orthonormality says. And secondly, they're at right angles to one another inside of this vector space of, of class functions. So a little bit of strange geometry is coming uh, to play here. The geometry of Hilbert spaces, finite dimensional in this case, inner product spaces. Ah, okay. And now here is the example I was just telling you about. So thanks to these theorems, you can figure out uh, how many irreducible representations any group ought to have, and, and then you can check uh, an example. And once you've found enough, you, you can stop. I'll let you amuse yourself by trying to find those three representations, let's say for the symmetric group on three letters. Okay, good. Now back to uh, our friends, uh, these geometric spaces, the compact Lie groups, SU2, SU3, and so on. Uh, so I mentioned one of them is a three-dimensional sphere and one of them is a sort of twisted product of a three-dimensional sphere and a five-dimensional sphere. And the other SUNs are similar, but more complicated still. Uh, on each of them, because you're dealing with, well, a compact manifold, uh, there's a natural notion of integration at play. And uh, each function on such a group can be integrated to produce a number, just like in calculus. You can take the integral of a uh, function. And it turns out you can do it in a unique way, which is compatible with the group structure up to some simple normalization. Uh, so I'll call that's called Haar integration and, and I'll just write it in this way here. So for example, for SU2, uh, SU2 is the three dimensional sphere. Uh, if you want to integrate a function on a sphere, well, you can do that using calculus. That's what the job of calculus is, is to figure out how you define and calculate things like integrals. And that applies 
to SU2. And uh, so we have this integral. There's nothing mysterious. It just is what you learn in calculus, multivariable calculus, of course. And once you have an integral, uh, just like we did uh, with, with Scheer and Frobenius, you can, you can make the space of functions on a group into a, a vector space, excuse me, an inner product space uh, in the lingo uh, which just came into being just before Weil got into this game. You can make it the functions on G into a Hilbert space. And the first uh, result of, of Weil in this direction, he, he carried out with his postdoc, uh, Peter, uh, and what he proved is the analog of the theorem that I mentioned before. I'm not going to show you anything about the proof of this. He just emulated what uh, the algebraists did for Benius and Schur, and he added a crucial extra ingredient, which is the famous spectral theorem of, of Hilbert. Uh, and then he came up with the following, they came up with the following conclusion, that the characters of the irreducible representations of any compact group always form an orthonormal basis for the Hilbert space, you have to throw in a few words because now you're in infinite dimensions as an infinite number of characters. They form an orthonormal basis for the Hilbert space of, well, here's another word, square integrable class functions on G. So with, a, with, with the natural accommodations to infinite dimensions, the very same theorem that we saw before uh, is still true. And you just need to pay a bit of attention to the details because now you're, you don't just have a finite dimensional vector space. Eric, can you say again what the class function is? Yeah, a class function on a group G is a complex valued function on the group. And it, let's just call it F for a moment. And it satisfies the identity F of G times H is F of H times G, which is the same thing as saying that F is constant on each conjugacy class of the group. Okay. If you have an abelian group, then class function uh, conjugacy classes just have one element, g times h is h times g. So the class function uh, idea is kind of vacuous. Uh, and you might expect that this theorem of Peter and Weil boils down to something that you've seen before. And that's in, indeed exactly the case. Suppose you take the, the circle group. Uh, if you have a function on a circle, then you can subject it to Fourier theory and you can decompose it in this way as a. Fourier series, and, and we all know that if you integrate z to the n, uh, uh, the inner product of z to the n uh, and, and z to the uh, k, then you will get zero unless n is equal to uh, k. So these uh, z to the n's are orthogonal to one another, and with the appropriate normalization, they're, they're actually orthonormal. So the z to the n's form an orthonormal set. Every function can be expanded in terms of them. That, that's to say that the z to the n's form an orthonormal basis. This is the theorem of Frobenius and Scheuer and Peter and Weil, uh, proved a uh, hundred years before by, by, or thereabouts, I guess, by, by Fourier in the case of the circle. So it's not completely new territory um, here if you've never seen representations before, because there are these very strong echoes uh, with Fourier theory, which you probably have seen. Okay. And now uh, I want to tell you about a beautiful result from calculus uh, due to Herm Hermann Weyl again. So we have the Peter Weyl theorem. We have Weyl's integral formula. Soon we'll have Weyl's character formula. It's just Weyl, Weyl, Weyl all the time. And uh, so this is a formula for what happens when you integrate a function on G, which happens to be a class function. And, and what happens is uh, the following thing. Well, uh, if you have a function on G, and, and if it's a class function, then since every conjugacy class contains a diagonal matrix, the function is completely determined by its values on the diagonal matrices. So you can expect the integral of F over all of the group to somehow be related to the integral of F just over the torus T, because you're not losing any information when you're dealing with class functions when you restrict from G to T, to the diagonal matrices. You can also expect, because it's calculus, that there's some sort of Jacobian factor that you have to stick into the integral before, you're, uh, before you can write down a true formula. And that's exactly what happens. And, and, and what Val did is he determined what this factor is. I'll show you on the next page. And then there's some normalization stuff here. The volume is no, no big deal. This one over n factorial has to do with the degree of the covering map that I showed you earlier, the ramified covering map I showed you earlier. So here's Weil's uh, integral formula. It's proved 
by uh, calculus. And, and what you do is you study the map, the conjugation map that I wrote down earlier, and you calculate its derivative in the sense of calculus. And once you calculate its derivative in the sense of calculus, you can calculate the determinant of the derivative, uh, and, and that's the Jacobian. And what Hermann Weyl figured out is that the Jacobian is always um, positive or at least non-negative. In fact, it's always an absolute value squared. And, and what you square is this interesting expression here. This is the this function delta of t that we'll see a lot as we go along from here on, so-called vial uh, denominator. So the vial Jacobian is the absolute value squared of the vial denominator, and it's given by this sort of combinatorial formula, the product of all zi's minus zj's, where i is, well, I've written it here, is less than j. Of course, I'm making a choice here. That I would get exactly the same vial Jacobian uh, if I made a product over all i's bigger than j. There's some um, symmetry breaking, which is involved. Oh, and what are these zi's? Well, I'm imagining t here is some diagonal matrix, and they're the diagonal entries of, of t. Okay, it's just calculus. Why do you get a, an absolute value squared uh, when you do this calculation? Well, that's related to the fact that these spaces g mod t, which I told you a little bit about before, always turn out to be complex manifolds. And the, the mod t squared that you see here has to do with that um, complexity, the fact that g mod t is a, not just a, a, a real manifold, it's always a complex manifold. Okay, that's a rather beautiful formula. We could stop here and declare victory. It's a beautiful formula um, in the realm of geometry of compact Lie groups, but we, we were more ambitious than that. Okay, first of all, just uh, for fun, here's a little exercise. If you do this for SU2, uh, it's kind of fun what ha happens because the, the torus T, like I said before, is one dimensional. It's actually a circle. The space G mod T, like I said before, is actually a two dimensional sphere and, and G itself is a three dimensional sphere. So there are spheres uh, everywhere and it's very concrete what's going on. And when you calculate what this vial, oopsie, when you calculate what this uh, vial denominator is, what you find is that it's the sine function. Ah, maybe it's twice the sine function. I don't quite I don't vouch for the constants here. Um, and you can just calculate it by, by just by calculus. Okay, I'm not going to do that either. Oops, did I miss a page? No, okay. All right, so now let's get, uh, get uh, serious and start to, I uh, want to now describe to you what this vile character formula says. The characters of irreducible representation, to, to list the characters of irreducible representations is, is basically the same thing as listing the irreducible representations themselves up to equivalence, because like I said, uh, Frobenius and Schur discovered that you can completely recover a representation up to equivalence from its character. So if you can write down a list of all of the irreducible characters, you've in effect, written down a list of all of the irreducible representations. And that's what Vial uh, does. And the indexing set for this collection is the is these things that are written down here, the so-called, it's a lot of words, strictly dominant weights. It's a little bit of a mouthful, but what it just means is just a list of integers, A1, A2, up to AN. So for example, for SU3, it's just three integers. Uh, and, and what dominant means is that the integers are non-increasing. They go down. Dominant would mean this, less than or equal to, less than or equal to, less than or equal to, excuse me, greater than or equal to, greater than or equal to, and so on. Strictly dominant means the, there are strict inequality signs here. So for SU3, uh, uh, an example of a do strictly dominant weight would be the sequence 3, 2, 1. And, uh, and there's a little uh, loyally red tape, uh, fine print at the bottom, uh, the sequence 3, 2, 1 is deemed to be equivalent to the sequence 2, 1, 0, which you get from 3, 2, 1 just by subtracting 1 in each slot. And it's also equivalent to uh, 4, 3, 2, which you get just by adding 1 in every slot. So really, a strictly dominant weight is not a, an n-tuple of integers. It's an n-tuple of integers modulo the constant tuples. And according to Hermann Weyl, the set of all irreducible representations can be identified with the set of all strictly dominant weights. Here's what it looks like for SU3. The, the condition of the, the space that I wrote down before, uh, Z3 divided by the diagonal uh, sequences in, in Z3, 
that's a two-dimensional space, if you like. It's a, it's a lattice inside of R3 divided by the diagonal copy of R3, which is a two-dimensional vector space. And, and here is what the set of dominant weights looks like as a subset of a two-dimensional vector space. It's just a cone of uh, lattice points, just like you see. Of course, this goes on uh, forever. I just got uh, tired of writing them all out like this and so on. And the way to think about that is the following thing. If you look at the the, the space R3 modulo the, the sequences which are constant, the, the triples which are constant, it divides into six regions. There's a region where the first entry is bigger than the second, is, is bigger than the third. There's an entry where the first entry is bigger than the third, is bigger than the second, and then all of the other possible permutations. And as for these axes here, the, these are the axes where two of the three entries are equal. And of course, they intersect where all three entries are equal, and because we're dividing out by all of the AAAs, that's just a single point. So the set of dominant, strictly dominant weights, I should have put in the word strictly, uh, is, is, is as you see in this picture. If we were just to be dealing with dominant, then I'd have to introduce these ones on, on the edges as well. These would be the dominant ones with the less greater than or equal signs instead of the strictly greater than signs. Okay, that's it. That's the picture of all of the irreducible representations of SU3. And what Weil says is that the character formula itself has the following weird Kabbalistic uh, form. If you have one of these strictly dominant weights, like I was just telling you about, for example, for SU3, 321, that would be an example, then what you're supposed to do is build a function uh, depending on that strictly dominant weight. Here it is. And that function is a ratio of two other functions. And, and the denominator is the thing we saw before, the vowel denominator. Not, it's now our friend. We already saw it. And the numerator is something a little fancier. What you do is you take uh, the matrix entries, Z1, Z2, Z3, and you permute them in all possible ways, in all of the six possible ways, Z3, Z1, Z2, and so on. Uh, and then you remember the signs of the permutations and you build this uh, alternating sum, like I say, which is reminiscent of a, of a determinant. It is a determinant in a certain uh, context. Uh, so we have an alternating sum on the top and a product uh, on the bottom. And uh, this defines a function that Val calls chi, I'm calling, following Val, chi sub a of uh, t. And, and these are the irreducible characters. This is a complete list of all of the irreducible characters. Here is, a, oh, I guess I've, uh, it's on the next page. Here is not the statement of the vowel character formula. Let's just introduce some notation. Instead of writing out those um, gigantic products and gigantic sums, let me denote the numerator just by alt for alternating uh, A, because it depends on A of T, and then the denominator delta of T. So chi is alt A divided by delta. The, the numerator depends on the, the choice of A, the choice of strictly dominant weight. The denominator is always the same, the vowel denominator. I just want to point out a couple of things just to get you familiar with this formula. Uh, the first is that uh, if you were dealing with a sequence, A1, A2, A3, which was not dominant, maybe because A2 was bigger than A1, or maybe A2 was equal to A1, then one of two things is going to happen. First of all, if, if it was the case that dominance failed because some AI was exactly equal to some AJ, you can easily check that this alternating sum would collapse to zero. It's like when you take a matrix uh, where two columns are the same, the determinant's going to be zero. So it's no, no big deal at all to see that if uh, A is a sequence of integers and if two of them, uh, are one of integer is repeated, then the, al the alternating term is zero. So you're not going to get interesting functions that way. Uh, the other possibility <clears throat> is that you have a sequence of distinct integers uh, but they're not listed in decreasing term. Well, clearly, after some permutation, they will be listed in de decreasing term. And that tells you that alt of uh, A, which is n distinct integers, but not least this listed in decreasing order, that's just going to be, well, up to a sign uh, alt of some strictly positive, uh, strictly dominant weight. So the, the strict dominance condition, what it's doing is it's eliminating certain non-interesting, uninteresting uh, possibilities, these ones here, and it's removing redundancies. We don't want to list the same 
uh, character twice and, and by inserting this idea of strict dominance we, we managed to avoid doing so and now here's the val character formula i guess you can still hear me everything is good yes yes okay good <laughs> sometimes you know you just stay uh, here here i am in my little room half a world away what what do i know what's happening uh, here's the statement of val's uh, formula I, I showed you a bunch of functions there's one for each of those red dots in the diagram that i drew before uh, all of those functions, they're a little bit problematic, those functions. Let me go back uh, to the formula for these guys. These functions are a little bit problematic because if you happen to have a diagonal matrix uh, where one entry zi is equal to another entry zj, then you're dividing by zero here, and, and it's a little complicated what's happening. Turns out that in that situation, the numerator is also zero, but it's zero over zero, so it's a little bit ambiguous what this character function is when you're dealing with a diagonal matrix which has a repeated eigenvalue. Sorry, Nevertheless, it turns out- go back to this previous slide? Yeah, sure. Uh, so when I look at this beautiful formula, where do I see the group G here? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you, you barely see it at all. You might ask, what is it that we're extracting from the group G? Exactly. Uh, to build this formula. I suppose I was dealing with a, I don't know, an orthogonal group instead of a unitary group. How would the formula differ? And the, the answer is it would differ in a very subtle way as regards the, the combinatorics of this uh, expression. Here we're dealing with all permutations of n letters. The, so the permutation group plays a critical role in this formula. If you're dealing with orthogonal groups, it's a very slightly different um, combinatorial permutation group which enters. It's not all permutations of n letters, it's a subgroup of some larger permutation group. So what the um, formula needs from the group G is some combinatorial information about some group of permutations. What that group is, is it's the normalizer of the groups, subgroup T inside of G divided by T itself. That's the so-called vial group. So the combinatorics of the Val group appears in the top, and in the bottom uh, appears the some information about what are called roots uh, of the group, uh, some additional linear, linear algebraic information about the way the group acts by conjugation on its Lie algebra. Uh, I, I'm not going to say more than that. In fact, I'm not going to say more than much because my time is almost up here. Here's, here's Val's theorem again. I am going to force you to, to listen a little bit to the proof of this theorem because it's just so cool. And we're almost there. The, the proof only requires a page or so. Uh, so these functions, the ones I just showed you uh, and the ones that Piotr and I were just discussing are uh, nice functions on T, despite the fact that you're dividing zero by zero. In fact, these are continuous, in fact, smooth functions on T. Um, they are class functions on the group G. They extend class functions on the group G. And those class functions are the irreducible characters. And you get each irreducible character exactly once, no rep repetitions. So if you like, these are the irreducible uh, representations. Uh, like I say, I have some commentary on this formula, but uh, time uh, presses, so let me just uh, give you a hint about how this is proved. As I mentioned, Val um, started thinking about this in the very early days of Hilbert space, and it's Hilbert space theory along with calculus, which uh, we put together in an incredibly creative way to, to build a proof. Here's the first thing, which is rather nice. Suppose, let's remember this Val integral formula. It tells you how to integrate a class function over G in terms of just T. And what it says is that if you take the class function F and you restrict it to T and you adjust by some Jacobian factor, then integration over G is the same as integration over T. And in the language of Hilbert's space theory, the integral formula tells you that this uh, restriction map here is a unitary isomorphism. So the Hilbert space of class functions on G, which is the Hilbert space whose orthonormal basis is the irreducible characters, can be understood just in terms of uh, functions on T. There's a one over N factorial, because there always is. And I've added the term anti-symmetric here, because the vial denominator has an interesting property that if you take a diagonal matrix, Z1 up to Zn, and you switch any Z1, any Zi with any Zj, then, then delta will change by a sign. 
So delta is not a symmetric function on the torus, it's uh, on the diagonal matrices, it's an anti-symmetric function. And the relevant Hilbert space sorry? is the Hilbert space of anti-symmetric functions on T. I'm sorry, could you kind of amazing. repeat what, what does this uh, one over n factorial means? Uh, since yeah, it thank you. As, uh, what as, it means is the, that if you really weight? want a unitary isomorphism, a unitary isomorphism, then you need to adjust the, the inner product by dividing the inner product by one over n factorial. Okay, so rescaling uh, just the inner product. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. And now, because we started with a, a basis over here made out of the irreducible characters, when we apply this formula, we'll get an orthonormal basis over here out of the irreducible characters. So the irreducible characters map to, by restriction to T and multiplying by delta, an orthonormal basis of this Hilbert space, which has to do with Fourier series, just about commutative groups of, of diagonal matrices. We're nearly there because something marvelous happens at this uh, very point. First of all, I'm just repeating what I wrote on the, the bottom of the previous slide. The irreducible characters create for us an interesting orthonormal basis of this Hilbert space. How interesting is this basis? Well, one of the things you can say about it is that it's made out of Laurent polynomials in the Z's with integer coefficients. That's because every character is a Laurent polynomial in the Z's with integer coefficients, because when you restrict a character of G to T, it's just a sum of irreducible characters, and those are just Laurent monomials. But then you have to multiply by delta, and that gets rid of the any positivity properties you might have. And, and what you're left with is just a Laurent polynomial with integer coefficients. So we've created a basis for this funny Hilbert space consisting of Laurent polynomials in Zs with integer coefficients. We're doing Hilbert space theory, and we were doing calculus uh, as well. And now we're in the world of sort of combinatorics or elementary number theory, where the coefficients are integers. And the final part of the argument is a remarkable fact that if you look at this elementary Hilbert space and you ask yourself what possible orthonormal bases are there whose elements are Laurent polynomials with integer coefficients, it turns out there's only one. I mean, up to some irrelevant signs, which I'm going to ignore. There's a unique such basis, namely it's the basis made out of all of these alts. So you don't have to know what the representations look like. You don't have to do Lie group theory. You just have to examine that this particular Hilbert space has one and only one basis up to some minor sign issues made up out of elementary expressions, which are integer combinations of Laurent polynomials. So when you take the characters and restrict T and multiply by delta, you must get members of this, alternate, of this canonical unique basis. So any irreducible character restricted to T times delta is some alternating form. That's just to say that any irreducible character restricted to T is alternating form divided by delta. It's kind of amazing. And now the theorem is proved. Uh, I do have a couple more slides, but I will just uh, pass them over. This slide should say uh, thank you for uh, your attention. Thank you so much. All right, time for questions. I have a minor technical question. Could you just skip over the slides that you didn't have time for slightly slower so we can just extract them from the recording later? Oh. Uh, I see, sure, yeah. And of course, I'll give you the slides as well. Um, this is one of those uh, two slides. Um, here is the other. And I believe there is not a third one. Yeah. All right. Come on. Uh, okay, I have a, a few questions. Uh, if you uh, deal with these compact groups, the space of all irreducible representation up to equivalence is always discrete. Is it true? That's correct. Yeah, I, I showed you a picture for SU3. There are similar 
higher dimensional pictures, they all look like lattice points in a cone. Similar, excuse me, pictures for any um, compact connected link room. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, the second part of my question is uh, the following: What is the easiest example? Uh, obviously, it would be no, non-compact anymore. Uh, in which the space of irreducible representations up to unitary equivalence is something which is non-Hausdorff? Probably the easiest uh, to um, compute in, in full detail would be the space of irreducible representations of the Heisenberg group. So the three by three real matrices, which are upper triangular and have one standard diagonal. So that's a three-dimensional so-called nilpotent Lie group. And what it's um, um, irreducible, it's unitary dual looks like is the following thing. First of all, there's a, a usual Euclidean plane like this, an R2. And then there's a line coming uh, like the z-axis coming orthogonally to this plane. Uh, that's what the dual looks like, but the topology is a little bit uh, crazy. As you travel down the vertical line, towards the origin in, in R3. Uh, the limit points of any sequence traveling down the vertical line are everything in, in the intermediate, in the equatorial R2 plane. So the topology is not how sort of the closure of the vertical line is everything. The vertical line has its usual topology, the plane has its usual topology, but the closure of the vertical line in, in the whole space includes all of the plane, it's, it's everything. Wow, I see, okay. Uh, so. You already mentioned this Heisenberg group, so it has some application. Some application. It is very important in this context of uh, quantum physics. So, could you yes. give some more perspective on, on this fact of uh, this space being non halter Is uh, it um, possible to to uh, interpret it from the point of view of quantum mechanics? Sort of, yeah. Let, uh, let me uh, draw this picture in a way that's uh, a little more um, uh, persistent. So we have this. Uh, plane and then this line uh, going down. And, and let's call this uh, the vertical uh, height uh, C, uh, or if you like, uh, let's call it even better, let's call it H bar, okay? So I'm, I'm, I'm coordinatizing this space and the vertical coordinate I'm going to call H bar, um, just to be both suggestive and, and maybe annoying to a physicist, I, I don't know. So that, now you understand what H bar means for me in my narrow mathematical uh, realm. Okay, so uh, in, in physics, H bar is a certain actual number, a certain actual positive uh, number. Well, times uh, it's it's not dimensionless, but let's just call it an, a number. And uh, it's important for physics, for quantum physics, that H bar is not zero. When H bar becomes zero quantum physics, so to speak, becomes classical physics. And that's kind of what's happening in this picture. All of the different levels away from the level at zero represent different versions of quantum mechanics in which the value of H bar has just changed. And, uh, and then what happens in this uh, equatorial plane is the degenerate case where H bar is zero. So this is the world where the classical world, if you like. Uh, so the, the plane here is the, the classical world, um, not the quantum world, and, and everywhere else uh, we have the quantum world. I don't know if that helps so, or not. Is it somehow related to the fact that if you do this uh, deformation, uh, you consider this quantum plane with mm -hmm. Moya product, you, you get something which is, uh, uh, as I said, isomorphic to, to compacts, yes, and compacts are Morita equivalent to the point. So somehow yep. this, this resembles this picture. Yeah, this is, yeah, if, if you take the Heisenberg group and you take the C star algebra of the Heisenberg group, then that C star algebra is actually a field of C star algebras over the space of all possible H bars over the line. And uh, at every point in this uh, continuous field, the, the the fiber C star algebra is exactly what you say, the compact operators, except when H bar is equal to zero, and then you get C zero of the plane. So you see this in the sense of real uh, strict deformation quantization inside of the C star algebra of the Heisenberg group. I should have talked about the Heisenberg group anyway. Okay, thank you very much.
You're welcome. Anybody else? Go ahead. Well, I just want to make a comment. Uh, I think that your lecture was perfect for our students. I mean, the level of difficulty Thank you. is uh, appropriate. You know, I'm one of the organizers. I'm very happy. I'm really very happy. Thank you very much. Let's see if there are any questions on Zoom. Okay, I don't see any raised hands. Oh, you, oh go ahead, Barbara. Thank you for the lecture. I wanted to ask uh, if you can uh, uh, say something more about uh, the formula, but for different groups, like for orthogonal or uh, SP. Yeah. Um, so what the formula says in general, so it's always a quotient, a ratio, and uh, the sum is over the so-called vowel group. This is one of the big players here. This is the normalizer of a maximal connected abelian subgroup of G divided by T. It's always a finite group. Uh, it's always possible to define a generalization of the sign representation. Um, and, and then uh, what you put here is, is phi of W of T like this. So phi, I guess I'll call it A, or maybe alpha is the version of A that we were talking about before. And then in the denominator, uh, what you have is E to the I. Uh, and let me not call this alpha, let me call this phi. My more standard notation indeed is uh, alpha. Maybe I'll write this as, sorry, I'm um, So this is the, a, a product over all so-called positive roots, which I'm not going to tell you what they are, but they come from studying the way a group acts by conjugation, the adjoint action on its Lie algebra. And then there's some X of I alpha applied to T alpha over two minus X of I minus I alpha over two applied to T. So that's the general formula. Um, and uh, it involves two things, a collection of special quantities called alphas, the so-called positive roots, uh, and then this, this vial group. So this is the set of all so-called positive roots of the pair consisting of the Lie algebra of T and the Lie algebra of G. It's, it looks more complicated, and, and the, the reason it's more complicated is, is purely combinatorial. Everything in the definition, in the presentation I was giving, turns out to be the same, except the combinatorics becomes a little bit more complicated. This W is like a group of permutations, but it's not the group of all permutations. And um, these alphas occur in a way which is like the way that these ZIs minus ZJs appear, but it's just more complicated. I mean, if you want a formula, that you can write down it all at once like I just did, but it should be true for any group. Obviously, it has to be more complicated, and, and this is this is what it is. Um, people in Lie theory just digest this stuff. They spend a lifetime talking about um, positive roots, and so for them, it's com completely obvious what's going on. But that's what happens when you study this sub subject for years and years and years. Otherwise, it's some slightly mysterious combinatorial stuff that, that gets in the way of understanding what's going on. Okay, thank you. And may I ask uh, what uh, what are the newer results that that were mentioned mentioned that are connected to the subjects of? The... Yeah, um, I mean, I wouldn't say they're new results. They're examples of new 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 perspectives on this theorem. Uh, and when I say new, remember this theorem's been around for a hundred years, so they've they've occurred regularly over the last one hundred years. So they're not maybe so new today. Uh, but for example, I, I mentioned that not far away from uh, compact groups are certain complex algebraic varieties, these flag varieties. And uh, what Atiyah and Bott observed, this is you know in the 1960s, so it's not new uh, by today's standards. What they observed is that the vial character formula can be thought of uh, as, a, as, as a type of fixed point formula for, certain, for the action of... Um, the maximal torus T on, on the flag variety G mod T. So um, 
it's rather beautiful how that happens and it, and it offers a completely different perspective on the proof which has nothing to do with Hilbert space and um, integration formulas it's just a completely different uh, proof uh, there's uh, there are other approaches uh, coming also from algebraic geometry involving um, this this is due to Burrell and Veya in, involving holomorphic line bundles on GMRT uh, there are yet other approaches which are purely algebraic using Lie algebra theory. There are many, many different ways of understanding the same formula. And what happens as you leave the world of compact groups and you go into non-compact groups, for example, is that the, these many different aspects of the, of the one Val character formula develop in, in completely different ways and they show completely different perspectives on, on the subject of representation theory. They're, they're all equivalent for compact groups, but when you go to non-compact groups, these different perspectives begin to separate from one another and they, they all offer something valuable uh, to study. So that's the sort of thing I, I, I had in mind. Okay, thank you. Arek, go ahead. Yeah, so thank you, Nigel. Uh, for nice talk. Nice to see you. Uh, really, we would like to have all the talks of that style. But my question is, because you are in some sense in Poland, where Professor Voronovich introduced mm -hmm. quantum version of SUN, and, and he developed, but he couldn't obtain really hope that approach like you, yeah, it's like classical. But this was some years ago. I don't now follow, but maybe you know, what is now in quantum groups, at least as you and Q, is such a nice also theory like in classical or? Well, the what, what happens for a compact quantum group is that as you deform away from the classical, each of the irreducible representations also deforms. So the in some sense, the, the, the space of irreducible representations of a, of a compact quantum group is the same. As, as the space of irreducible representations of, of the, the, the classical group, which is being deformed from. But when you um, make this deformation, certain things break. Uh, the, the group becomes, I don't know, less symmetrical than it was uh, in, in, in the classical world. And uh, I think you have a lot of, I'm not an expert on this, but I, I think various of the things that, uh, well, you can see on this slide in front of me, uh, which which seem to be essential to the whole enterprise from Val's point of view, like the Val group, they don't make uh, so much sense. They don't operate. In, I mean, it's these these are finite groups. That there's a sort of rigidity to them, but but they don't. The, there's nothing which plays the the role of the of, of W quite the way that the W plays its own role in the classical case. I think that's a a fair statement. Maybe Piotr can correct me if I'm wrong. I can correct. Yeah, so thank you, thank you very much once more for. Excellent. Anybody else from Zoom? There are two raised hands, but I don't remember who was the second person. Nobody. Anyway, somebody has a question. Oh, okay, <laughs> so, so Marek is clapping hands. Why were you so What happened? <laughs> oh my goodness. I unmuted myself, so, so, so now, yeah, speaking to two microphones at the same time is a, a big snaffle. Uh, so if there are no more questions, uh, let me make a very quick comment about uh, this, um, what you mentioned at the very beginning, that you know everything about your, your disciple representation from its character. Uh, uh, let me substantiate this statement with, I think, a very beautiful example, which holds both in the classical and and quantum realm. So, so imagine that you take a compact principal bundle with a structure group G. Imagine that you take its finite dimensional representation, say an irreducible one, and then having a bundle and a representation, you can immediately construct an associated vector bundle. You can take its K-theory class. You can apply uh, the turn character to cyclic homology of smooth functions on the base space, okay? And then you can, you really compute what it means. I mean, the only thing that you vary, so your bundle is fixed, your group is fixed. The only thing that you vary is your representation, okay? And then when, when you really crank the machinery and compute the formula, it depends on what exactly on the character of this representation. 
and and this this defining property of a character it it, it actually allows you to to give a cyclical cycle you have cyclicity built into the character and better still it holds exactly in the same way for compact quantum groups and even in bigger generality for principal coactions so uh, i i really like your opening statement because it resonates with mm -hmm. this is how it also appears in the term galois time okay yes cyclic permutations are okay uh arbitrary permutations like you see in this w not so yeah, okay exactly. in the non-commutative realm yes yes cyclic uh, work perfectly well okay good so if there are no further questions or comments let us thank nigel again for his beautiful exposition thank you very much So now we hope to see you in Ben Levo in person sometime in the future. I hope, uh, it's, yeah, in, in your beautiful new. It's like a, it's like the first class section of an airplane up there. Exactly, there. exactly. So, so you know, that's theater. why we we can allow only really good talks.